thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and this is our uh, alumni and current student panel. Um, but at the moment, <laughs> pretty much more on the alumni panel at this point. Um, but some of, uh, some of the people on the panel have only just recently uh, finished their studies with us. And um, so they'll be able to give you a very up-to-date kind of um, take on, on their time at SOAS. Um, so thank you for joining us. We hope you found today's um, open day um, gives you a lot of experience, knowledge, um, a bit more background to our programs, um, a chance to interact with the academic staff, but also with student ambassadors, um, and to learn a bit more about SOAS, our programs, and whether they're gonna suit you. And that's really what these events are about, is kind of really learning about our programs um, and whether you will be the right fit for us, but also whether we will be the right fit for you in terms of what you would like to study with us, but also what you would like to do after your studies. And that leads us very nicely on to our alumni panel today. So I'm just gonna go through a few quick housekeeping rules um, for you. I'm sure many of you have um, used Zoom numerous times over the last um, couple of years, as I think we've all become very accustomed to various different um, digital platforms. But if you're not as familiar with it, um, if you just scroll across either the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, depending on how you have your Zoom um, configured, you will see there are various different icons that you can use there. And so the main icons that you'll be using today probably will be the chat function, uh, which is a little speech bubble box where you can put in there any um, particular questions that you might have that you might want to pose to all of our panelists or some of our panelists. Um, you might want to quickly pop a, a message in there now just to let us know where you're calling in from today, um, what brought you to today's session, um, and also maybe what subject areas you're interested in. Um, so do feel free to, to pop that in there. Um, if you do have any problems with the um, audio or with the video, um, what I would say is not to sound too IT-like, but if you can um, leave the room and then re-enter, that will probably solve some of those issues. Um, and we have set up the session today that will allow you to do that. So it will allow you to exit and then re-enter in without any problems. Um, the other thing uh, you can do is if you hear any feedback um, in terms of the audio, that might be a problem with our microphones. So just to pop a, a quick message into the chat and then we can have a look at that for you. Um, and then the other option that you have, um, if you just move two icons over from the chat box, is you have the raise a hand function. So we do want this um, session to be as um, kind of um, engaging as possible and we do really want to hear from you so if you would like to ask your question um, via microphone uh, you can do the raise a hand function just to let me know that you would like to raise a question and then I can invite you um, to switch your video on if you would like to um, you can keep it off if you prefer um, and then to have your microphone unmuted. Um, so what I thought I would do today is maybe just have each of our alums um, slash current students, um, introduce themselves, give a quick background to um, what they studied at SOAS, what brought them to SOAS, um, maybe what they're doing now and what career aspirations they might have um, in the future as well. Um, and then just really just to open up to any questions you might have about the students' experience um, of SOAS, um, things they liked about SOAS, things they um, might like to see explored further at SOAS. It's a very kind of open forum here and, and at SOAS we do take on our um, students' perspectives and our alumni's perspectives on our programmes and how they could um, change over time. Um, and there's always um, areas in which we can look at improving. Um, and so I think it's really great to have that open dialogue with our alumni and with our current students and also with our students who will be joining. So as I say, do feel free to pop a, a quick message in the chat just to say your name um, and where you're calling in from and possibly a subject area that you have an interest in. And then what I'll do is I'll go around um, the room and, and introduce each of um, our panellists to you or they will actually introduce themselves, but I'll call on them to kind of give a quick intro. Um, and if there's anything else you need, do let us know. And one other final thing I should let you know is, is that we are recording this session. Um, so just to make everybody aware of that, we always like to make um, anybody attending our um, ses sessions know that we are recording them. And that will allow you to listen back to these sessions afterwards. We will send uh, full links around to everybody, but it also allows any students who weren't able to make the session today, maybe they're in a different time zone, or maybe they've got work commitments, maybe they're in classes um, to access this at a later time. So again, thank you all for um, attending today. I hope this is be a very informative session for you. 
Um, and I'll probably kick off by kind of going around the room and just um, having everybody introduce themselves. So um, Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself first? Hello everyone. Um, I guess old age before youth and anything else. I'm obviously the <laughs> oldest on the panel. Um, my name is Patrick Dramsfield. I'm, I'm coming in from Hong Kong and I, I studied Far East Area Studies, which sounds an odd name these days, but anyway, that was what it was called. And it actually really was Chinese History, Politics and Anthropology. Uh, it was an MA and I started in 1988 and I actually finished around about 91 because I did it kind of part-time because I was self-funded. So I did all the courses in one year because I was working at the same time. And then I did my um, Viber or you know, thesis the following year. So it was an interesting year to be doing, an interesting period because of course this is 88 to 89, 90. So it was an interesting time, but a long time ago, probably ancient history for you guys. And um, what, what are you um, doing now, Patrick? What kind of oh, area? Okay. That's, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm a writer and a photographer. That wasn't exactly planned. And uh, perhaps when I get a little bit further down the line, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, how you may be looking at your life as you go forward. Uh, a lot of you have got a lot ahead of you, hopefully. Um, but um, I, I used to uh, run events and, and have regional events for lawyers and uh, in-house counsel, which are kind of lawyers inside big companies. But of course, uh, that all uh, went adrift during um, uh, during COVID. So actually one of our panelists said that she's from Dubai. That was the last time I did an event. And actually in February, 2020, I was in SOAS library because that was one of the few places that, uh, you know, this is all pre-COVID to some degree, the wave happened uh, to, to, to London after Hong Kong. So uh, uh, yeah, so currently I'm writing, I've published a book on photography, which is based on photographs I took in, 86, so a couple of years before I, 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 I um, did the MA at SOAS, and I'm currently finishing off a novel. Oh, great, fantastic. <laughs> and so maybe we'll move next to um, Alexandria. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexandra, or Alex is also fine. I mostly go by Alex. Um, nice to talk to you all. I'm joining you from Ottawa in Canada. Uh, so it's morning for me, which is why I'm drinking uh, my coffee. Um, so I did the MA in International Studies and Diplomacy program. Um, I did it from 2017 to 2018. Um, so quite recently, I saw that already there's uh, someone in the chat who's interested in that program. So happy to share my experience. Um, so I actually, um, I used to be a journalist. So that's interesting that Patrick uh, mentioned that. I did that actually before going uh, to SOAS to do my master's. So I did my master's as a bit of a career change. Um, I had done my undergrad in journalism in Canada and I had been working as a daily reporter, but I realized I didn't want to do that anymore. So if anybody um, is wondering about, you know, going back to school after having been out of school for a while, I, I took uh, eight years off, I think, before I went back to my master's. Uh, I can definitely discuss about that. I'm actually currently working, um, now that I finished, I work for uh, Global Affairs Canada, so for the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and International Development for Canada, and I'm a policy analyst. Um, so I absolutely would not have gotten <laughs> my job without the master's at SOAS. And um, the, the studies I did specifically, the fact that I got to do international law as part of my studies is really cool. Um, the master's programs equivalent in Canada don't actually offer that unless you're already a lawyer, <laughs> which I'm not. Uh, so, and I actually get to, I use international law in my job every day. So the fact that I had that experience was um, really, really great. Um, while I was at SOAS, I did a bunch of stuff. Uh, so I was the student representative for my cohort. Um, so um, at the beginning of the year, they always uh, elect someone from the class, a class representative to kind of speak on behalf of the students um, with the faculty and also um, with the student union, all that kind of stuff to be your representative. So I did that. It's a great experience if anyone's interested in that. I was also a student ambassador. Um, so that meant I gave tours on campus and I uh, did talks like this on campus to people, uh, either student prospective students or sometimes visiting lecturers or uh, visiting international students, all that kind of stuff. Um, and what's really great about the uh, CISD program, so the, the programs at the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, is you get to do the mix of practical along with um, 
the theoretical, which is why I decided to go to SOAS. And I highly, like, I think that's the best part. Well, there's that. And also the fact that all of your classmates are from somewhere else in the world. I think uh, we, in our group of about hundred people, we had like 70 different countries <laughs> represented, which is of course, another great thing about SOAS, um, specifically if you're planning to work in international affairs, because your, your classmates are going to be your, the future diplomats and the people you're going to be working with. Um, yeah, so I will leave it there, but I'm happy to ask uh, to answer any questions. I'll take a peek through the chat and yeah, nice to talk to you all. Thank you, Alex. And then maybe um, Hadil, you could go next. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Hadil Hamid and I uh, did my studies, I, my master's degree at SOAS in development studies from 2014 to 2015. Uh, and at that point in time, I had been working for five years. Um, so that's where I did my postgrad in development studies specifically. Uh, I really think and I would highly recommend the fact that you actually get a chance to work a bit before deciding to go for a postgraduate degree because I feel like it really helped me understand what I wanted to get out of the program and it really added the richness that I was looking forward to in, in joining such a diverse uh, program as well. Um, I'm currently working as a senior manager in the program for people and planets at Expo 2020 Dubai. You may have heard of that. Um, <laughs> so it's been uh, keeping me very busy, but I can definitely credit SOAS to a lot of things that have happened in my career ever since. Uh, every single position I've ever held has really looked at SOAS to have added a lot of value to my profile. The fact that this is one of the highest ranked development programs uh, in the world really does come in handy and it really helps to have that in your back pocket when you're applying to a job. And coincidentally, two of my bosses had either studied briefly at SOAS, done a semester or a year, or had done a postgraduate degree there themselves. So it really helped to have people in the field recognize the value of that degree and understanding what you bring to the table when you say that you're a SOAS graduate. Uh, I'd love to elaborate on all of that, but I don't want to take too much time. Um, and I'm very happy to you know, answer all of your questions. We'll definitely return to some of those points because I think they're really kind of interesting areas and definitely I think I saw a few heads nodding here so definitely there's that shared experience. Um, so maybe next we can go to um, Tamali if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes you are. Hi I'm Himali De Silva and I'm from Sri Lanka. Uh, I did my master's in financial and financial law in 2007 and to my knowledge, I think there are only two other Sri Lankan SOAS graduates, Rishini and Sachi, both were friends, all women. Um, and we've all loved our experience at SOAS. I, right after my master's, joined Deloitte Consulting in the technology arm in London. And then I was seconded out to the US practice as well. And then I worked for KPMG Consulting afterwards. I was a management consultant for about 15, 16 years. And now I am a startup owner, one promoting circular consumption in Sri Lanka, and the second helping businesses and personal brands build and grow their brands. Um, my time at SOAS was invaluable for many of the reasons that others touched on as well. The student body, the academic body, just the culture itself, walking into campus, uh, both campuses actually, because I used to have half at Russell Square, half at King's Cross. I loved my time at SOAS and I will definitely say the fact that I have a master's in finance and financial law versus just a master's in either one has set me apart. Thank you. Any questions I'm happy to answer. Great, thank you. And we'll definitely be coming back to some of those. And I should let you know that we actually have uh, two Chievening Scholars with us this year who are both from Sri Lanka. Um, and so after their time with us this year, they will be actually returning back to Sri Lanka. Um, so definitely there'll be a couple more. Uh, so I of to, us then. <laughs> to, uh, to, your, to, your, to your kind of network, um, if you will. Um, so then maybe I can go to um, Jeffrey next. Sure. Actually, I am uh, recently graduating from SOAS. Uh, and last year I did the MA in Southeast and Pacific Asian Studies. Uh, it is a really a special program. And as an area study student, I'm able to get explored to uh, courses and modules from various departments. I came from an art history background. 
uh, but I, apart from art history, I also did courses, of course, on language and uh, politics and etc. Uh, many, many different kinds. So um, I, I guess I will be, yeah, I may be able to answer. Oh, and also especially for the more hybrid and online mode of study in SOAS. Perfect, thank you, Jeffrey. And then maybe we can then move to Jenny. Hiya, I'm Jenny. Um, I've been at SARS a while. Uh, <laughs> I did my BA from 2016 to um, 2020 in uh, Japanese and Korean, um, and my MA in um, Japanese studies from 2020 to 21. Um, and now I'm currently um, a PhD student at SARS as well. Um, can't get rid of me. <laughs> uh, and I'm researching into accessibility technology um, for um, people with disabilities um, and how that can kind of help in the workplace in Japan, um, to kind of put it in a nutshell. Um, obviously, I've been around <laughs> a long, long time here now. Um, so uh, any questions about SOAS and how it works and that kind of thing, I can probably answer. Um, and yeah, and happy to answer any questions at all. Oh, great, perfect. And maybe um, Insini, you can go next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Insini. Sorry about my internet it's been on and off, so I've been in and out. <laughs> um, so I did my MSc in Development Studies at SOAS between 2020 and 2021. So I recently just got my dissertation results. And uh, my time at SOAS has been fantastic and it's been great hearing every uh, other people's experiences pre-pandemic SOAS because I, I could hear, like I could literally see that, you know, times were really different in terms of like student experience and all of that. But um, I absolutely loved my experience at SOAS uh, despite the pandemic and the support, all the support that the faculty and the school at large, the wellness team, all of that that has been uh, granted to us. So, and I'm calling in from Kenya. I just moved back to Kenya. I was in London um, for the, between 2020 September to September 2021. Yeah, so um, before doing my MSc in development studies, I was working for the government of Kenya for one year. I was specializing in uh, development, uh, partnership development, uh, specifically in coordinating partnerships in um, the most marginalized regions in Kenya, which is the northern part of Kenya. Yeah, so that's basically my main area of expertise. And after graduation, hopefully, I am looking to go back to my um, former job. If not that, probably in similar position with more experience, with more knowledge and understanding on what development actually means. Yeah, and uh, I'm happy to be able to answer all the questions that you guys have in terms of um, on in development in, in the Masters of Masters in Development uh, Studies uh, course. And yeah, so I think that's all I can have. To, that's all I have to say for now. Great, thank you so much. And there was definitely a lot in there, and we'll definitely draw some of that out, I think, during the session. And then we also have Amani. Um, so if you'd like to introduce yourself, Amani. Hi, I'm Amani. Um, unlike everyone else, I've only done my undergraduate at SAAS. Um, I did a BA in International Relations from 2017 to 2020, um, and I have recently joined the Student Recruitment Department at SAAS. Um, again, same as Jenny, can't get rid of me. Um, <laughs> um, during my time at SAAS, um, I was a student ambassador, which was pretty vital for me to get this job. Um, and I think similarly to um, other people, it's helped me figure out what I want to do as a career. So definitely a valuable experience. Great, thank you. And then I should probably introduce myself as well. I'm Kim, I'm head of the um, student recruitment team here at SOAS. Um, I have worked in higher education for about 13 years now. So maybe showing my age a little bit there. I've worked with students um, from all around the world um, I've been lucky enough to travel to over 30 countries to meet students, um, to tell them a bit more about programmes in the UK, studying in the UK, um, and more recently at SOAS, so I haven't been out on the road so much um, due to COVID, but I think um, 
But one thing I really love about SOAS is quite how many students we engage with uh, um, and how open those students are to engaging with us um, through lots of different platforms, particularly in the last two years where, you know, there has been such a major change. And I think that that's something that really brings a lot of students to SOAS is that idea that you will be able to share experiences, perspectives, ideas, um, and that you will be coming from but you'll be coming from different perspectives, but it's the idea that everybody's open and wanting to understand more. Um, I always say it so as that you might not always agree with every single person and every single opinion that you hear, but it's being really open to kind of that discussion. And at SOAS, we think that our students um, and our alumni are as vital as our staff in terms of um, the, the programs that you take and what you take away from the program and the learning that you do within the programs. Um, because it's, you know, we always say it's one third the academic staff and it's one third um, your peers who you're studying aside, alongside. And then also it's one third the environment, that ability to interact with people and also facilities wise, you know, having things like the library resources. Um, but I think definitely people are, are at the heart of SOAS, if anything. Um, and that's really helpful to bring everybody today. So maybe um, we can go through some of the questions. And I apologize, everybody. I thought you had um, the option to do the questions to everybody, but it might look like you can't. So what I'll do is I'll read through um, some of the queries that have come into um, the chat box, and then we can pose it um, on a wider scale to everybody. Um, so it's um, lovely to see that we've got people joining from lots of different um, places in the world. So we've got people from London coming in, uh, people from Mumbai, people from Italy, um, Edinburgh, um, hopefully it's not too cold in Edinburgh at the moment, uh, North Carolina, um, South Korea. So we definitely got a lot of people and it looks like we've got quite a range of subject areas um, that you guys are interested in as well. Um, so some would be more minded towards maybe a particular um, sort of area studies. So things like studying um, Chinese, Japanese, um, uh, also those who are thinking of studying more international studies and development um, and um, politics. So quite the range. And I think maybe that's one thing I can quickly pose um, to our um, panel in that, um, how did you guys, um, feel about the very interdisciplinary approach that you take at SOAS. Um, I mean, in, obviously, if I start with you, Patrick, you took a program that was, um, you know, a very wide and broad program, and you got to study quite a few different um, aspects and a few different disciplines, uh, but maybe with a regional hat on, I would say. Sure. Um, actually, I want to pick up on, on what one of my fellow panelists said earlier about being curious and about, um, you know, the kind of, I think actually, Kim, you made this point as well of being so as being a place of many different diverse views and, and um, discussions. And I think that's very important. And um, so I think that's what I, I really took out of the program that I did. And if there was one discipline that I wasn't familiar with, which was part of the course, was anthropology, Chinese anthropology. And um, that has really shaped the way I look at my career afterwards, because really um, it opened my eyes to the fact that the companies that I was working with, and there's been quite a range, are kind of like anthropological subjects. And if you take it from that perspective um, and, and realize that obviously I've been lucky enough to also travel like yourself, Kim, to many different cultures, um, you know, there are certain core values, which I think I'd like to get onto a bit later if, if we do have time, that are underpinning the way that different cultures work. But anthropology was crucial for me. And also to pick up on that fact that um, what, what I really appreciated um, studying at SOAS were the friends I've made and have been lifelong friends. And the fact that, you know, the bedrock has been a curiosity and a willing, willingness to share ideas. So that's what I'd like to, to answer your question with. Perfect. And then would anybody else like to add to maybe um, if they feel that whilst they were able to be a specialist in a particular um, discipline that they were also able to maybe dip in, tip their toes into some other areas whilst they were at SOAS? I mean, I find my, I used to attend all the talks on like and go through the downstairs and see all the pottery and all the exhibitions and even the common room used to have because I think DEFIMS is a separate part when I started, 
finance and financial law was not a core cultural subject per se. So we were our own little thing, but we managed, I think the culture still absorbs when you're sitting there seeing even the, pro the protests <laughs> or uh, the cultural things that used to happen in the courtyard. So it was amazing. I could be studying finance, but I still got a massive dose of culture from just being at Sohan. Right. Yeah, I think everybody kind of feels that. So as you kind of, it, it, you just take it in from around you. Um, I know that many people in the past have said, you know, they'll be walking around SOAS and they'll hear maybe seven different languages in the space of half an hour. Um, and I know there's been many instances where they've heard just music coming from different buildings and thought, what is that? What, you know, what, what's happening here? What kind of instrument is that? And they've gone in and kind of seen a, a, an instrument they've never seen before being played and then had a bit of a discussion about it and kind of what culturally it stands for. Um, so I think that's really, yeah, it's definitely an added part of um, SOAS and the experience that you get. If I we could... had a question, oh, sorry, Jenny. Oh, sorry, I was just going to add um, that uh, as part of the MA, um, and I think Alexandra said in the chat as well, um, oh, Alex, sorry, and that you can audit courses and go to lectures that aren't a part of your program. Um, you can take open options as well um, for credit, as well as auditing in addition. Um, so I'm, although I was within the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department um, with Japanese studies, I actually took um, a translation module from the um, Linguistics Department and um, Korean lit modern Korean literature from the Korean Department. And I also took um, a course called Transnationalizing Queer, Trans and Disability Studies, um, which was obviously crucial for my own um, future research um, to have that kind of good background. Um, but that was from the gender studies department. And without that kind of um, interdisciplinary as approach that's so common at SOAS, um, I wouldn't have been able to kind of get that background in time um, without doing kind of additional courses and additional um, time before starting my PhD. Whereas because I had that good solid background from my MA all the way through, um, I was then able to kind of go straight into my PhD with everything that I needed. Um, so I found that really, really useful as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then maybe we, we have had a question in that comes, um, maybe a few of you have touched on this um, in your intros um, to say, uh, did you find it hard to return to academia after being out of academia for a while? So maybe um, Alex, I can throw that over to you in the first instance. Sure. Yeah, I um that's a great question, Georgia. Um, yes, it was it was definitely challenging, I'm not gonna lie. Uh specifically, I was not expecting the high amounts of reading that we had to do. How many, how many uh, you know, just how many like yeah, um uh what's it called journal articles that we'd be expected to read every single uh, week. I think part of that is maybe because uh, we don't do that kind of style really in Canada. It's much more uh, practical focus. So I was used to doing like maybe one uh, journal article uh, or, or two a week and suddenly I was doing like 10 or 15. Um, so I found that quite challenging, um, but there's a lot of resources on campus, which I did take, um, I did take advantage of. So, uh, I'm sure most of you probably have heard of like skimming and, and learning how to, you know, do the articles and all these techniques. I had never learned that before. I didn't do that in my bachelor's. Um, so literally I went to, um, there's the writing center um, and, there, and I presumably there's the same resources that you can access online. And I worked uh, with kind of, uh, I did a session with a coach for uh, about an hour and was like, look, I haven't done academia for, for like eight years at this point. I have, I was a journalist, so I've been writing every day, but it's a completely different style of writing. Um, and yeah, they just kind of gave me some tips. They, they gave me, um, lots of lots of help and they were there whenever I needed it and and I, I figured it out by like November by about this time in the year I got I got up to speed I figured it out I kind of had that good grounding um and it was okay and I should say but I finished with a distinction at the end of the at the end of the year so I did I did make up for it uh, I did make up with it part of it I guess is also the fact that you don't have to do any of your exams <laughs> and uh, really assignments until almost uh, the end of second term so by that point you really kind of know your your stuff um, so I was able to make up for the fact, but I will say the first month and a half, I was definitely feeling overwhelmed. Same yeah, for I'm... me, sorry, I was just going to add into that. Yeah. I only had a two year gap between my bachelor's and my master's, but 
the challenging aspect wasn't getting back into academia. It was actually applying for jobs towards the third, the third semester of going into the consulting or the you know investment banking programs. But SOAS career counselors help a lot. They really help place you and the name itself carries so much weight when you go for interviews. So highly recommend it to anyone. <laughs> Great, thank you. And then maybe, um, Hadil, maybe you can add to, um, to kind of the, the break within today's time. I know you had a break. Yes, uh, I'd love to dovetail on that. My break was about five years uh, between my undergrad and uh, when I decided to do my program. And it actually, while it was challenging in a lot of respects, it was really enriching because you can actually relate practically what you're reading, especially since I had come from a background of development prior to that. I was working in monitoring and evaluations uh, as part of the Ministry of International Cooperation back in Egypt, which is home. Um, so it really helped me relate a lot of the concepts that I had already been interacting with and seeing it on a higher level at that point in time, looking at it theoretically, getting a more well-rounded well approach to it. I think it was very useful. Uh, I did find it challenging uh, in terms of aligning what I was used to because I studied my I did my undergrad at the American University in Cairo in political science with a specialization of international law and I double minored in economics and business but the formatting that I saw at SOAS was quite different uh, we were used to more intimate class settings uh, I came to see that it was more of an auditorium full of 150 people and then the tutorials which were the the chance that you could get to have a more intimate discussion on these things. So that was the biggest adjust, adjustment, I would say. But I wouldn't say that taking a break is too challenging to thwart anyone off before pursuing their studies again. Yeah, and then maybe just, I mean, that's all, all great um, experience and advice and that. And I, there's so many good points you made um, within that. I mean, one thing I would say to do is, um, Unfortunately, we don't offer them yet for all of our programs, but we will be extending them is that we do have um, what they call MOOCs, which are massive open online courses. Um, and I've actually taken two of SOAS's MOOCs over the COVID period, just because I think I was in a Netflix wormhole and I was like, I need to, <laughs> need to probably be watching something other than Tiger King or <laughs> whatever else is on. Um, but I had been out of academia. I've been out of academia for many, many years now. And I, in my daily life, I write reports and business plans and strategies and um, all of these different things, but I don't write academically. So I think when I first took the MOOCs, um, it kind of gives you a guide. It says it's going to take about two hours of your time up per week, and it'll be a five-week MOOC, and you can start at any time you want. I would say it probably took me more like four to five hours per week. Um, because just again, getting my head around the reading, reading something in a different way, um, also reading something. And again, this kind of goes to the interdisciplinary side of things with a number of different kind of um, perspectives, um, because I do think that's probably a, another challenge that uh, we give you at SOAS, but hopefully it's a challenge that all of our students want to, to rise to, is that we don't teach you in silos. Um, we don't believe that you are coming in to study one subject and that subject lives on its own in its own little world. Um, and so, you know, you actually have to kind of think, I am going to be a specialist in international studies um, and diplomacy, or I am going to be a specialist in finance and management, or I am going to be a specialist in art. But I also need to know everything else that affects that. Um, I need to know if I'm doing a law program, how it's affected by economics, how it's affected by politics, how it's affected by anthropology. Um, and so I think that that's another challenge that our students have. So you'll have the challenge of coming back into academia, but you'll also have the challenge of, you know, taking a, a very broad look at things. But we do have all the staff to help you. And I, I'm really happy, um, Alex, that you mentioned about the additional um, services that you use. I don't think our students use them enough. Um, I always tell the students, you know, whether you're an international student or whether you're a UK student, there's all of these different facilities to help you with essay writing, exam preparation, even as simple as note taking. Um, and I do know one lecturer at SOAS who, um, he doesn't like anybody to take notes in his classes. So he's, if he sees you taking notes, he's like, no, I want active listeners. I want you engaged with what I'm talking about. I want you to be engaging with each other. So he supplies a lot of notes afterwards for you. Um, but I think that I remember 
I saw one of his classes and everybody just looked stunned when he was just like, <laughs> no note taking, no scribbling away on a notepad. I want you, I want you really engaged. So I think that is things that you should definitely take on as a student, wherever you go, whether you come to SOAS or whether you go elsewhere, is to really use all of those facilities that are there for you. And there are pros and cons to coming directly into um, your masters from your undergraduate, but there are also um, lots to be gained from going out um, and knowing, and I always say the SOAS programs are a bit of a two-way street in that when you're applying for them, we are looking at you as, do you have the background that we want? And uh, you know, how will you add to our cohort? But a lot of times we're also thinking, do we have what you want? So what are you hoping to get out of the program? Where are you hoping this program takes you? And sometimes we have an excellent, um, excellent applicant and they have just the right background, but they want something that we can't give them. And so we kind of go back to them and say, you know, this is what you stated you wanted. Is that exactly what you want? Or, you know, how else can we help you? What other avenues are you interested in? But it's very much about making sure that that is something that matches with our students so that you know once you've taken a program that you'll get to that end goal. But maybe we can actually maybe then turn this back around to something Patrick said is that you might not you might not know what your end goal is or the world happens around you <laughs> and things change all the time. So maybe I can just pose the question to our alumni of um, in the various different roles that you've had since you graduated, um, how do you think SOAS helped you to, I guess, direct that kind of career path that you've had or possibly redirect it in, in some instances? Oh, Kim, can I pick up on a couple of things and then answer your question? Um, I am a big note taker, and it's good that certain things haven't changed at SOAS, because actually I'd, I'd be pretty miffed if I was told I couldn't take notes, because that's one of the ways that people can learn. And I'll tell you very quickly, just a quick anecdote. When I started at, um, the course, which was an English language course, and I'm glad that SOAS has probably changed this way, um, the late Professor Stuart Schramm did it in Mandarin for the first term because he wanted to get rid of some of the students. Now, I'm actually quite a tenacious person. So I sat through and I could understand a little bit because I've lived in China. So, you know, obviously that's probably light years away from the way that you guys organize it now. And I don't think anybody should be able to get away with that uh, today. But very quickly, um, what I'd like to say, I've given a bit of thought to this um, because obviously, um, you know, I'm, I'm 57 um, and, um, you know, I've, I've got a little bit of experience to perhaps share. And what I, I, I thought last night, what would I actually have found useful to hear on a on a, an alumni and a student um, talk when you know um, when I was 20, 24, however old the various people are, and even perhaps a bit older as well, because I'm a slow learner. And the first thing I wanted to do is actually you talk about a journey. I think everybody should get a copy of this, and you probably can't see it, but. How will you measure your life by Clayton Christensen? And what he had to say was, I had thought the destination was what was important, but it turned out it is the journey. Life is that journey. So basically, one of the things that you really need to have is life skills. And I just very quickly talk through those. I think curiosity, this is from Egon Zender, which is actually a, a kind of company that hires CEOs. So you know, a lot of you are probably very ambitious and there will be CEOs listening and maybe CEOs to come. But curiosity is by far the most important trait that they look for. So I think most people who end up at SOAS have got that quality. And then that leads to insight. And then you need to actually be able to communicate. So learning communicative skills are very important as well. And then determination and resilience, because we all, I mean, I think most people realize this with COVID that, you know, obviously everybody has had their own very personal experience of that. And, uh, and you know, there's, there's been terrible things happen. But the other thing that I think is really important is to have a moral compass. And I'm gonna come back to what Clayton Christensen said. He said that he was at university at Harvard actually with Jeffrey Schilling. Now, Jeffrey Schilling was the CEO who took Enron into complete disaster and ended up in prison and in, my experience, I think, you know, all of our lives will be quite diverse, etc. But you do have to set a moral compass and that will do you an awful lot of good in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, there's a lot to think about there. And, and definitely, I think all of those things also are 
kind of approaches that SOAS takes as well in, in many of the things that it looks at um, and many of the areas that we, we try to, uh, to kind of look at um, the challenges that we hope our students will um, look at kind of maybe some of the ways in which we can overcome them, though we obviously know that some of these challenges that are there in the world are much bigger kind of things, um, but everybody doing their small amount to it can help. So yeah, I definitely think that there's a lot within that. And I definitely think that all of those qualities are things that I've seen within our students um, and particularly um, across uh, so many of the countries that we have students joining us from. So maybe I can just quickly um, just revisit some of the questions and um, thank you everybody for answering a lot of the questions that are in um, the chat. I think we've had um, some questions that are more around kind of, again, SOAS facilities. And um, I think everybody's touched on it that we have, you know, a great library facility and a lot of the resources that are there. Um, maybe I can pose this to kind of Jeffrey and maybe also to Jenny, um, because I obviously know that you were studying in the time of, of COVID. Um, SOAS has um, special librarians within our library um, who are able to really get hold of lots of different resources for students. Um, how did you think they helped you in your um, last year or so with us? Maybe I will start with this first, uh, because <laughs> last year when I'm doing my dissertation, it's already getting better, but, but uh, during the term time, uh, basically accessibility to library is quite limited, but uh, I think in the foreseeable future, that won't really happen again, probably won't. And so, but even that happens, uh, uh, actually it's quite easy to order the books that you would like online, and they will basically get them reserved uh, for you at the front desk, and you just need to go in and, and pick them up. And, and uh, as same as many university, uh, we have a lot of subscription on all the e-journals. So especially if you're looking into uh, something that published more recently, journal papers, usually they are all available online, even books, a uh, uh, lot of them have, have e-books. And um, so I would say uh, there should be a lot of issues for you. And in, in SOAS, uh, we got also, if you're doing uh, area studies and looking into uh, something specific about your region. We also good, got a, quite a good archive, uh, very special different kind of materials. So you might also find something that you would want uh, here in the special sections of the library. Um, and then you could just request uh, from the librarians and make a booking. So it's, it's actually pretty smooth and easy, I would say. Can I add something? Yeah, sure. Uh, on the issue of library, I think oh, for journal articles and books that uh, SOAS does not have sub subscription to, you can actually go to the librarians and they give you an email of um, someone who specifically would help you get access to the journal articles or the books that you're looking for. So there's always that special, um, how do I put it? Yeah, special access if you really need the book or the journal article. So there's always access to all the articles, all the books that you need at SOAS. Great. And then I think another query that we've had come in is, um, I think we've already answered it a few times, but maybe we could go in a bit more detail about um, finding jobs after you've finished your studies. Um, so some of you would have only just recently finished and, and maybe um, starting to return um, home to your home countries or thinking about staying in the UK and others of you would have finished some time ago. So uh, would anybody like to talk about um, maybe how they look for jobs in that final part of their studies? Um, and you know, maybe was the first job you went into after your studies that ideal job that you thought it was going to be? Or was there kind of a, a bit of movement and a bit of changing here and there? Maybe I can ask Alex to come in on that one. Sure, so I know that the question was specifically asking about the UK. Uh, in my case, I happened to be uh, in London during the about the only two years when uh, the postgrad visa 
was removed. Uh, so <laughs> I couldn't stay unless I got uh, an actual job offer, but that has, that restriction has been revoked now. I just managed to get those, those two years when, you know, during the Brexit years when uh, that didn't exist anymore. Um, so I personally, I wasn't actually looking uh, to stay in the UK. I knew I was going to be going back to Canada. Um, so I, I didn't, but, but friends who did stay, um, uh, there was, there's a list. So there's actually two, I'll say two things. Um, cause so uh, there's two ways to kind of stay and some people don't know about the second way. So I'll explain it to you guys. Um, so, and these are friends of mine who've done it, who are still in the UK now. Uh, so one is that there is a list of, uh, got approved, um, employers that, uh, can change your visa from a T4, which you have, if you're an international student, um, studying uh, to a T2, which means that they can sponsor you to stay uh, and work. Uh, so you can actually, the, the list is available online. You can look at it, you can see kind of all these 5,000 or 10,000 or however many, it's a long list of companies that uh, have been pre-approved pre to do that. Um, and so it's easier for them to, to help do the application for you to stay than a company that's not on that list. So number one, I would target those ones if your goal is really stay um, also, all of you will have the option if you are an international student to stay just via the the, the, the changes to the visa. So it won't be as critical for you. Um, but the other way, which people often don't know, uh, SOAS is one of the schools that can sponsor you um, if you wanna start your own company uh, to to stay uh, through a visa through that program. There's a, there's a little, um, there's like a, a branch within it. Uh, they have, I think up to 12, uh, 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 Kim might know the exact number, but there's a certain number of spots that SOAS can sponsor people every single year. And uh, one of my colleagues from my cohort did that, got one of those spots. Um, and basically you need to be able to come with a kind of a business plan of what you're gonna do. You need to have like a very um, thought out plan, but you don't, once you get the visa, you don't actually have to be making money off of your job, uh, off of your company or whatever it is you're doing to stay. So uh, I know two, actually two, former SOAS grads who did this. They got the visa, they went, uh, they're actually both American. They're both from the US, so this is how they stayed. Um, they got their visa uh, through SOAS sponsoring it, so you get two years for that. But then they also ended up working um, on it and they worked for other companies because it's just an open work visa um, as well. So they, they, but you have to regularly do reports to show what you're doing and to show that you're, that you're really focusing on it. So one of them actually, uh, her project was the Center for, for uh, Feminist foreign policy, which maybe you've heard of. Um, and, uh, you know, SOAS is, is quite a big sponsor of that. So she wasn't actually making money off of that thing. She was working on the side, but she was doing regular work and was able to stay in the UK with that. Um, so that's, so those are the two comments I will say, um, and I'll let other people speak. And then Hermani, maybe I can have you give your experience. Uh, so Deloitte sponsored my work visa and I got my offer before I actually set for because I had an undergrad from Monash and I joined SOAS for my master's. And the thing is, it's called milk rounds when you're applying for consulting and investment bank. There's several rounds you have to apply while you're doing your master's and go through several rounds of it. And I remember I got my offer before I sat for my final exam. But the fact is the SOAS name carried weight because Monash is an Australian university. And I don't think it was, I can't remember exactly, but I remember when I was trying to apply for some of the investment banks, Monash wasn't even coming up, though it's like number 21 in the world. For some reason, this is in 2007, Monash was not coming up in the list. And then when I checked up, it's because the Australian education system is different from the UK. So you do your three-year undergrad and then you're invited to read for your honors degree to get your distinct, you know, your first class mm -hmm. 2122. Australia doesn't do that. You go for a fourth year if you want it. So I had a three year undergrad, but I didn't, I didn't take my offer to do my honors because I was like, why would I waste another year? <laughs> um, but then that was a problem when I was applying for English universities, even though I had a distinction average for my undergrad, the university name wasn't coming on the list. So luckily I was studying at SOAS, so I went through. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's and it's it's definitely. I really um, am grateful to you for mentioning about starting that process early. Um, obviously, we know that as a student coming into a program, you're going to have lots to do in terms of a program. We've already talked about how challenging it is and how interdisciplinary it is, but really starting that kind of career journey and looking for careers um, at the start of your studies is as important as the end of your studies. And and often I do find that our students don't access the career services as early as I think they should do. 
Um, but in particular, I, I know um, with finance, because I have a few friends who kind of work in finance, that there are particular periods of the year that um, that finance looks to kind of do its main um, recruiting. And that happens across many different industries and many different sectors. Um, even in education ourselves, we look to employ people at particular times of the year that it's going to work best for our next year of, uh, of operating. So I think it's really important that students do visit our careers um, advisory service, do book in one-to-one -one appointments with them. They can do everything from um, interview prep to um, looking at personality tests to um, looking at presentation styles to just looking at how you write your CV. Um, I think in the UK, everybody has a different idea about how they write their CV. And I think when you put the international context into that, it changes wildly as well. And I, I've seen quite a few different CVs um, over the years because a lot of students put a CV into their applications. And I can tell you, I've probably seen about a hundred different iterations of a CV. And then everybody's looking for something different because some um, employers don't wanna see any more than one page. And I'm yeah. now getting to the stage of my career where I'm thinking, you know, I've, I've been out working for, you know, 25 years. How am I gonna put 25 years on one page? <laughs> But in some instances, you need to be able to do that. So I think that that's really where these kind of services come in. And definitely, um, it's worthwhile you think about. I should probably add that we do have the graduate route visa now. So apologies, Alex, that that wasn't available for the two years that you were with us. But it makes things a lot simpler for um, our international students because it means that you can stay in the UK for up to two years, whether you found a job or are looking for one. Um, so it gives you maybe a little bit more breathing room, though I'd start to still say, Kind of build those networks early and um, get some experience in um, and then as I say that allows you to apply to a visa and you apply to the visa first and then you apply to jobs afterwards and you will be able to when you're looking for jobs in the UK you'll see that it might say do you have the right to work in the UK and previously what our international students were finding is that they they couldn't tick that box so some employers would say if you don't have the right to work in the UK we will sponsor but if I'm uh, you know, to be honest with you, that's quite a lot for an employer to be doing. So most employers would just say, if you don't have that, unfortunately, you can't apply to this role. Um, so now it means that the world is your oyster in terms of those roles and that you can apply to as many of them as you would like. So it just makes the, the process a little bit more um, simple in terms of actually applying for jobs. You still have to work as hard to get them. And I would say that if anything, there's going to be a wider um, field and in a way that will bring its own challenges because you'll have people with again lots of different backgrounds and perspectives and um, experience that you'll be going up against in terms of working but it takes that initial kind of barrier um, down for you. Kim if I'm I just going to go through that. a few more Sorry. of the yeah I just wanted to add two things quickly um, one I studied finance and I was a banker before. I thought I applied only for investment banking jobs, but one consulting job. I just thought, oh, the source told me apply to Deloitte, I did. I ended up taking the consulting job, not the banking job. And half the graduates who were with me were Oxbridge or like, you know, the top tier universities who had all done masters also to get in. And they had studied languages, philosophy. They don't when you're going into graduate programs, it's not about what you study, it's how well you do what, like your culture, your interests, they're really testing your personality because you need to remember you're competing with the best in the best of the best in the world for these kind of jobs. So it's not about having done finance, it's about having done something well. So even if you are passionate about a language at source, you can still go for the banking job. Well, maybe not banking, but consulting, you definitely can. And the second thing is I got a five-year work permit from Deloitte and then I converted it into my residency. So your work years count towards your British residency. So I'm a British permanent resident, like still up to now. So I just wanted to highlight, it's not a only two year thing. If you can continue to work for five years, you can get your UK residency too. Yeah, definitely. And so it gives you that two years at first kind of, um, experience but from that you can build other links and it could be that you stay with the same employer past that two years or it could be that you now have you know some experience under your belt that makes you more employ um, employable to somebody else I know again just to kind of pick up on the finance thing just because I have a few friends it's very common to see the um, PwC move to EY 
move to Deloitte <laughs> back and forth. I guess I'm going to head hunting from me. each one. So, um, I mean, definitely that helps you get that foot through the door. Um, maybe we've had a question that is, can anybody give me a typical day at SOAS? I'm not sure there is such a thing as a typical day at SOAS, but would anybody like to maybe say what their experience of a day at SOAS would be? Well, I, I can just oh. jump in here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Hedella, if you'd like to go. Uh, sure, thank you, and sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think the beauty of SOAS being located right in the heart of London gives you an unlimited amount of options of how you can shape your day. Um, well, I mean, basically, I you have a lot of flexibility in your schedule as well and how you actually pick classes. And I, I was lucky enough to have classes three days a week, but really intense back to back schedule. And it really allowed me to fully immerse myself in all the on campus activities and the lectures that I could attend. There were lots of parties and networking options as well, which I would really recommend that anyone who's going now, hopefully with things easing up and people being more physically located on campus, um, definitely do that. Networking is one of the most important things that you can get out of this experience, and it definitely helps you in leveraging your connections to get any kind of job opportunity in the different parts of the world, because again, you're in a melting pot of cultures at SOAS. And especially if you're looking at something like development or international relations, your colleagues are going to be situated in all parts of the world that you're going to want to find yourself in either in a year's time or right away or a few years down the line. So definitely invest a lot of the networking opportunities that SOAS provides you with. Um, I know it didn't really serve much in answering what a typical day looks like, but it really is what you choose to make of it at SOAS. I, that's the answer I would give. Would anybody else like to come in? Yeah, I just want um, to add to that. Oh, no, sorry, um, I was just going to say that I missed the lunches at the tropical diseases. I used to stick in there most, uh, at least once a week. <laughs> the Department of Tropical Diseases has probably got the best, uh, uh, the best canteen. I also just wanted to add that in, in addition to sort of the networking, there's also a massive social life at SOAS. Um, the JCR is our junior common room um, at SOAS and it's pretty much buzzing all the time, whether it's sort of the lady selling vegetarian lunches um, or there's people playing um, pool downstairs. There's always something going on, some sort of society um, or event happening in the day or at night. Um, so as well as being in the heart of London and there's so many things to explore and so many things to do, there's so many things to do at SAS as well, and so the societies and the sporting opportunities are pretty much endless. Yeah, I mean, that that's probably, to be honest with you, that's probably the answer is that there is no such thing as a typical day um, at SOAS. Um, and, and hopefully um, now we are also moving back to maybe how SOAS was pre um, the pandemic, which is um, very eclectic, um, something happening all the time. Um, each of our departments used to host at least two events a week, if not more and all the um, student societies would host events. We've got about 200 different student societies that you can join um, that really range from um, everything in terms of um, being charities and doing um, various different um, areas of activism through to um, some more social enjoyment, through to um, more particular areas of, of academia. So there's quite a few um, things that they do and even over the pandemic they kept up quite a few um, online events um, and when they could return to in-person events did those as well so yeah the answer is there's no typical day um, I would say it, typically in a course maybe um, if you're thinking about how many days per week you would be in in formal classes that usually falls over two to three days but again because of our very interdisciplinary approach that can actually easily spread over four days depending on how broad um, you're doing your studies in. Maybe one of the things I think is possibly something that everybody's done when they're at SOAS at some point, um, particularly in the last few years, is probably had um, the lunch, um, the free lunch from um, the Hare Krishnas. So that's probably something that everybody's done. And that's also one of my favourite things. Whenever anybody asks me about SOAS, like what's one of your favourite things? And I'll say it's that if you go outside at lunchtime, you'll see everybody from senior management to academic staff to um, the students, 
to staff who work in our canteen because they're not serving anybody because no one's eating their lunch, everybody's eating outside with um, you know their own Tupperware or a plate. And I just think it's somewhere where everybody comes and talks at the same time. And yeah, it's just really, really a community feeling. So um, I think that's really great as well. We probably only have time for a couple more questions. So I know that we've had a lot of questions answered in the chat. Maybe one we could quickly go back to was part-time study unit, which I know has come up a couple of times. Um, and so um, maybe Patrick, I think you can come in on that as well, in that how did you feel it was to do a part-time study and did you feel you could work um, alongside that? Was that quite a lot to juggle? And then maybe we can also have that more widely out to the rest of the group. Um, even if you did full-time study, a lot of you in this group, particularly I know um, Jeffrey, um, Amani, um, Alex, uh, Jenny, you've all done student ambassador work and how did you feel it was kind of trying to uh, to make sure you kept a good balance in terms of your work life and your your studies? Yeah, I still remember the trauma, actually, of walking towards an examination that I felt I was all prepared for. And that was I was working, but I, I had a flexible job. Um, so and I was working kind of quite late because sometimes we were managing people who were calling, it was a call center actually, so calling people in the States or whatever. So, and my employer who employed me for five or six years or three or four years beforehand um, were very, I think, you know, obviously I was not bad at managing people, but fairly indulgent as well. They hoped I'd get it out of my system. It was tough. You know, I still walk, I still remember walking towards my examination when I was doing Chinese history thinking, oh my Unfortunately, <laughs> I got through, but it wasn't easy, I have to say. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, as Kim mentioned about the Student Ambassador Programme, I think what's really good about it is that it's very flexible. So they will send out emails um, with jobs that are available. So you can do things such as campus tours, helping out with open days, helping out with events. But what's really good is that if you have a very heavy workload, say in term two, you don't have to sign up to the event. So it's not mandatory that you have to do, you know, a certain number of hours per week. You can sign up to as many or as little um, of these events as you want. And if you have a um, less busy time and you can sign up for more and it's just, it's a really good way to um, meet people, not only in your course, um, but in other courses as well. I remember I made so many of like my best friends at university were on the student ambassador program as well. Um, and it's just, it's really good to learn about the university as well in general. And just to add one final point, I think SOAS was great because I did communicate that I was working. I did talk to my tutors um, and, um, you know, I don't think they gave me an easy ride, but at least, you know, I was able to defer my my, my thesis as well. Otherwise, I, I just don't think I'd have been able to cope. But, um, so communication is really important. If you do feel that you're overwhelmed, talk to people. Yeah, and I think that's um, it's probably where we're going to um, kind of finish up. I think that's really important. And I think definitely the communication. Um, SOAS does make some um, allowances. And in particular courses, we do realise that some of our courses, we do have more people who are working coming into them. That's just like the natural um, flow, particularly in a lot of the um, CISD, the International Studies and Diplomacy Programme. A lot of it is people who are still either part time um, in their previous role or still want to keep an arm in that so we kind of are aware of that and we make changes to our schedules where possible and again because of the small group teaching aspect of SOAS we're able to do that I know with development studies even though it's one of our biggest departments um, during COVID what they did is they actually asked their students where are you going to be listening in from so are you going to be in the UK or are you going to be in um, more in kind of East Asia or Southeast Asia or are you going to be in um, South Asia so they could actually plan their seminar groups around that and so they weren't asking you to get up at the crack of dawn or stay up uh, ridiculously late and thank you very much Patrick because you have stayed up late for us for today but um, in terms of that they were very aware um, and then the other thing I would like to say whether it's part-time work whether it's full-time work um, whether it's you're thinking of doing a part-time program versus a full-time program whether you're thinking of auditing modules because I know that's come up in the chat um, whether you're thinking of trying to combine of quite a few different areas of study. I think the really important thing is to talk to us about that as you go through the application process, um, to use our academic staff as your guides, 
to what is possible and what's not possible. I think we've also touched on it here today is that coming back into studies, you know, you had a lot more reading than maybe you expected to have. And some of our modules have up to 200 hours worth of reading. So even when you've decided, yes, so as is where you're going to come um, to and you've decided which program you're on, you then have another decision to make of which modules you're going to take. And all of our staff can guide you through that process in, in saying, you know, these are all great modules to take, but they all have 200 hours of reading. Can you do <laughs> can you do that much in your time? And then auditing, we allow you to audit up to three additional classes in a year. But if I'm honest with you, I don't know anybody who can audit three additional classes in a year because um, it's a lot to take in. Um, you don't have to do the exams or the coursework, but we do want you to engage. So to be able to engage in that, you need to be doing the reading, you need to be going to the lectures and going to the seminars. So again, when you're at SOAS, we present you with a lot of options and you'll probably have more options than you know what to do with uh, sometimes, um, but we'll then help to guide you through that process. Um, and there's, again, there's pros and cons to both part-time and full-time. Part-time means you can maybe do a few more things, take a few more classes, um, but it also means you're gonna spend more time in your classes. So depending on how you sit financially, that is something you have to think about and also possibly one year behind in terms of entering the workplace. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you're doing a full-time course, it can be a lot to take on. It's very intensive. Um, and I don't think anybody in the UK would ever tell you otherwise in terms of our master's programme. So the, the great thing is to come to more of these events, to speak to us, to, to speak to our alumni, to speak to our current students, and just try and find out what really works best for you. And so with that, we'll probably end the session here. And I thank you all so much for your attendance and all so much for your guidance and your um, experience um, of SOAS um, as our alumni. And thank you everybody who's been listening in today. We hope that that gave you a bit more insight into what it's like to be at SOAS. I think the main takeaways are that you will study anything and everything, <laughs> that there's no typical day, um, and that really you will learn from the staff, but also from your peers um, and also just from the environment that you're in, because you will be both in London, which is a, an amazing city to be studying in um, and to live in. But you'll also be in a community aspect where you're meeting students from 135 other countries with a range of different backgrounds, um, perspectives, ideas, hopes, um, you know, aspirations moving forward and and it's really a great place to be um, and a great environment to be in it's challenging uh, but it's also hopefully uplifting at times um, and uh, will just help you to decide what you want to do in the future and not just in terms of career but also just in general I think I've, I've been at SOAS now for two years and I think my perspectives on many things have changed over that time um, and I know during my life, my perspectives on many things have changed as well. So hopefully this can just be one part of your, your journey, um, as Patrick referred to, um, in terms of where you go. So if anybody has any last comments that they would like to have, if not, we'll probably leave it there today and let everybody go on with them, everything else they have going on. There's a lot of different time zones that people are in, I know. So thank you again, for everybody who stayed up late or got up early. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.